Thank you to Sasnet, thank you to Lund University, thank you to Thalat, and thank you to everyone else for inviting me here to speak. First thing, let me very clarify very much, I'm not Kashmiri, I'm not from Kashmir. In fact, if anything, part of my identity is related to one of the occupier, which is India. So I thought I'll clarify, so when I talk of Kashmir, I don't talk in the name of anyone as such. So I'm not speaking for anyone, so I'm not presenting any particular Kashmiri or any other perspective. But I mean, going back to the movie, it was the idea was we show the movie so that we see a particular case of one man, his ideology, and also what the Indian state did. So when you asked, I mean, whether the body, you know, in bureaucracy is very complicated over life and death book, right? So for instance, if one is buried in one place, they can't be moved to another place, it becomes very tricky. But in this context, the idea was, as you pointed out, that normally the family has at least a right to see the body. In this case, they had no such right, or rather, they were denied that right. And Madhul is not the only one. Right? <laughs> but Kashmir in general, I mean, when you speak to Indians, they'll talk of Kashmir as a beautiful place with beautiful people, or occasionally, beautiful place with nasty people. <laughs> so place is beautiful, no doubt, right? But the idea is people are not good because they're traitorous. They don't really respect India. They don't recognize that India is a great democracy. Why don't they recognize? Because they are fooled by Pakistanis or they are Muslims. So Islamophobia and Pakistan phobia both come into play in denying Kashmiri any political agency. Now this image, of course, these are both taken by me. These kids, again, a lot of images you'll find old ones where they show nice kids and happy kids. The only thing I'll remind you of that these kids are from family that's victim of enforced disappearance. Around eight to 10,000 Kashmiris have been forcibly disappeared by the state since 1990, which implies that they're not killed. We don't know, they might have been killed, but they're disappeared. So with killing, you know, the body is there. Tortured, you know, the body is there. With disappeared, there is no body. So you have a phenomenon where kids are orphaned, but they're not orphaned. Your women who are called half-widows because they don't know whether they're widows or not. Now, in particular, you can imagine that if you have to bear that psychological pressure for 20 to 25 years, it's not going to be easy, right? So the, I thought I'll start with these images that on surface could look at beauty and nice and charming, but reality is quite different. Again, giving a two example, Parveena Ahanga, she is one of the first victims of enforced disappearance. Her husband was disappeared, 15-year-old kid who was disappeared. And she had been struggling for justice for her son and for eight to 10,000 other people since 1990. Only thing I'll tell you that what's the hope of anything happening is not a single case. So Indian government has, or Indian courts have refused to punish a single person so far since 1990. It's that clear. So what hope lies, I mean, what hope lies for mother, you know, Makbul Bhatt's mother to get her body back. If you ask me, I don't think there's hope till India exists as an occupying country, which it does. Now, international community will come later, where what it could role could be. And this kid, again, I met, in fact, I was sort of inspired to focus more on Kashmir. My work initially was on Tibet, another stateless nation. And we're talking of Middle East center here, and we can think of the largest stateless nation in the world, the Kurds, right? So my interest is largely in stateless nation, and that's how I came to Kashmir. This kid, he lost his eye, one of his eyes, through pellet injury. Now, pellet injuries or pellets are seen as non-lethal way of policing in India. The only thing is, you have got hundreds of kids who have lost eyesight or who have been maimed because of pellets. But at least one could say they have not been killed so far. That's how our Indian government will represent it. So the idea is, when we look at Kashmir, it should be very clear that I'll explain the historical background. I think that we are talking here of territory controlled by two states, but you're primarily talking of a people occupied by two states. And therefore, I don't use the Indian side, Pakistan side, Indian administrative, Pakistan administrative. I could, but it's very clear, we're talking of occupation. So Indian occupied and Pakistan occupied. <coughs> the story is very simple. Generally, when you read international academics, or for that matter, Indian and Pakistani strategic thinkers, 
I'm clear, right? For you, I'm clear. Okay. You see it in terms of India, Pakistan. So, Pakistan, sorry, Kashmir is always presented as a dispute between India and Pakistan. Mm. So, India claims, as Talib pointed out, that India is a secular state. So, the argument that Kashmir should be Pakistan because of Muslim majority doesn't hold true because India is secular. And Pakistan's entire basis was in Hindus and Muslims are distinct nation. And hence, in order to justify Pakistan, they need Kashmir. So it's about territorial conflict. And you can see a line. And it's a disputed line, of course, because both states refuse to recognize it. Now, the interesting part with this line, it looks neat here. It's not that neat on the ground, historically. And second thing is that we are talking of, so it looks, it this today, the boundary, right? So it looks very heavily, heavily militarized. So at least those who fetishize military and clear boundaries would think at least headache is not there. You have clear militarization. But the reality is, every couple of months, you're firing from both sides. Indian media, supposedly democratic media, right? Free speech and everything, they always say, Pakistan fired. And Pakistani media, again, also says India fired. Now, in today's world, okay, 30 years ago, you could imagine that how could Indian newspaper find out what Pakistanis are saying, right? It could be difficult. But today, there's no such excuse. And yet, I haven't come across a single news item in Indian media or Pakistan media that actually tries to balance or give both sides. They take sides very clearly and say, oh, Indians are victims or Pakistanis are victims. So you end up in a situation where cattle, and this is a cattle of course, uh, where the Indian cattle or Pakistani cattle shouldn't matter, but sometimes they do say, oh, it's a Pakistani pigeon coming into India. <laughs> Was very surreal. Few months ago, Pakistani pigeon was arrested in India because they felt that it was fine. Now, this is, I think, this buffalo is Indian because I saw it from a website which is Indian newspaper. So, saying how a buffalo is being harmed. Okay. Now, of course, these are firing on all sides, but people get killed. Soldiers get killed, but mostly civilians who get killed. Now, one could argue, but why do civilians live there? Because they have always lived there. So what happens is, in 1947, when India gets divided, when British leave India and India gets divided into India and Pakistan, you have a situation of the state, princely state of Jammu and Kashmir that remains independent. Now, they're not given the option of independence, so they're forced to choose between India and Pakistan. Both India and Pakistan want the state to join them. And the ruler, who's Hindu ruler in Muslim majority, is undecided. Like Muslim Baloch. Baloch, more like Baloch. Let's say Punjab, but more like Baloch. So very much like Baloch situation, like you know, Khan of Kala having to make decision, or like Tibet. Right? So they're similar situation. So what happens is the different stories as you can imagine, different narratives on this, but broadly the Indian argument is that there was an invasion of tribals, Pashtun tribals from Pakistan into Kashmir. The status quo was changed, and the Kashmiri ruler. Hindu ruler, invited Indian army to come in and help him. But the only way in which India would help is if the ruler signed an instrument of accession, joining India. The Pakistani version is that the tribal invasion was not, was spontaneous because Muslims were suffering, right? And second, that there was already a genocide of Muslims going on in Jammu, another area of Jammu and Kashmir, and where a lot of people had been excluded, and therefore it was something internal that Pakistan had only role of a neutral actor. So they, these are two versions. But so even today, so history is that. So history, both of them say we have our accident and Kashmiri narrative I'll come back to later. But the point, point is to keep in mind there's a deep cartographic anxiety both amongst Indians and Pakistanis. When I say Indians and Pakistanis, I mean the state and the nationalists. Not all Indians, not all Pakistanis. Now this is the official map of India and you can see that in this official map, this is gone. So that's the Pakistani control. And they should also have gone in here, which is Chinese control. Now, the thing is, there's a law which is very clear in India, which I'll read. Whoever publishes a map of India which is not in conformity with maps of India published by the government, they should be punishable with imprisonment, which may extend to six months, or with fine or with both. If you have an economist magazine, any academic in, uh, book, which has the real map of India, which is around this, right, which would say, at most it's Indian control, Pakistan control, it will become illegal. So not only Indian 
publishers cannot publish it. Even foreign publishers, including Economist, suffer that a lot from time to time. Right? You have a situation where they get stuck because they have to follow the Indian thing. So Indian government clearly uses a cartographic lie as law. Because it's not real. India has never controlled that, those parts. Now, India claims that's fine. So one could present it as a claim by India, right? No, that's not acceptable. So lie and fabrication of the boundary lies at the heart of Indian nation nationalism. Now, in case of Pakistan, of course, this is the realistic map of Pakistan, based on what it says, and this is the ideal map of Pakistan, which includes Jammu and Kashmir. So again, the idea is, that there's a difference between reality and what they actually, reality and their ideal. But both states punish any dissent from the ideal or the dream that they have. So you have situation where international magazines, apart from the Indians and others, they get, uh, they get, uh, let's say punished, but you also have in Pakistan where, let's say Pakistan historian showed Gil, uh, Gilgit as part of undivided Kashmir, it becomes a problem. So ideas, anyone who doesn't conform to what the states want gets punished. So you can see dissent is not easy. Now, a common way to look at India, Pakistan, so Kashmir is also, apart from India, Pakistan, it's okay, it's about Hindu versus Muslims. Kashmir Muslim majority, and Muslim and Hindu minority, and therefore that's the struggle. But the fact of the matter is going back to the movie and Magul Bhatt, and remember, Magul Bhatt is not the only one. There are others, but he's a good example. That there are different versions in Kashmir. You ask now how many people would want what. The best thing is to give them right to self-determination and make them choose. Exactly. The point is that's a right that has never been given and will not be given till these states don't change. So the idea is, so Magul Bhatt's ideology is very clearly about, you could see, India and Pakistan, his mother said India and Pakistan both have punished him because he was saying we want independence from both. So you have people in Jammu and Kashmir, not necessarily Kashmir, <coughs> Jammu and Kashmir, who support India. They're largely, but not exclusively, Hindus and Buddhists of Jammu and Ladakh, particular regions. You have got Kashmiris, which is already Pakistan control side, occupied side, and also in the valley, who support Pakistan. And then you have got a significant number who, if given an option, would choose independence from both. Now, things have evolved. So maybe in 1990, there was a referendum, Pakistan may have won. If today it happens, again, we are guessing, you know, it's a guess game. But my sense is that independence would be the strongest option. But these are debates that Kashmiris need to have. The problem is they have never been given that space to have that debate. Right? But that's it. Now, so there's conflict there. So as India claims Jammu and Kashmir is an integral part, integral part and any violence or resistance to uh, India that is a proxy war of Pakistan and resistance is due to few Kashmiri Muslims opposing India. And democracy is interesting because, and I was giving a talk in the morning, I was mentioning this, that democracy is normally where we use democracy against the state all the time. Right? So we use democracy to say, look, protect our rights. How dare you interfere in our internal affairs is a democracy. So democracy is always used by people against the state. In case of Kashmir and India, right, democracy is used by the Indian state to prevent any criticism of what it does, human rights abuse and denial of self-determination in Kashmir. So if you criticize India, they say, but we are a democracy. We are the world's largest democracy. And then you have got, uh, what's his name, Obama, and then you've got Putin. Putin doesn't say democracy, much, <laughs> but it's Obama and Cameron and all other leaders say, oh, India is a great democracy. Well, I'll, I'll talk of Indian democracy in terms later, but let's put it, this is that it's a very deeply problematic democracy. But the fact is, in the beginning, when, even if we access, and it's a very problematic one, instrument of accession was deeply divided, it was contested. But even if we accept, for China, okay, Kashmiri ruler, who was actually minority, signed with India, let's accept that. Even then, you have to keep in mind that India did promise a plebiscite. Both India and Pakistan went to the UN and promised plebiscite where it's the people of Jammu and Kashmir who will choose. So far, so good. Then over six months, both India and Pakistan agree to make it very clear that self-determination option is about choosing between India and Pakistan. <laughs> so from aspiration of people, they make it clear India and Pakistan. And this is a very slight of game where both states fight, but they make sure that the independent option is not there. 
Now, you have got Pakistan, of course. Pa according to Pakistan, it's an unfinished story of partition. Muslim majority, therefore, they should be part of uh, uh, Pakistan. It's conveniently ignored that Bang what becomes Bangladesh, East Pakistan was also Muslim majority, but, well, Pakistan had to accept its independence, but they ignored. They say it's a jugular vein. Now, very interestingly, all these countries, both countries, always use body language, language of body. So for India, it's the crown of the head. So if you look at India, it's the crown. So can you really chop off the head? If you chop off the head, then the entire thing collapses. For Pakistan, also jugular vein is here, you know. So very interesting where nation states use body language to prevent any right to self-determination. And body, so you, the language of body to deny human rights. And now Pakistan is generally better and cleverer in how it handles the Kashmir issue. Because at least it pays lip service to self-determination. It will talk of self-determination. It will talk of UN resolution. Now, UN resolution is India-Pakistan. Now, the problem with even Pakistan's position is, in a sense, Pakistan has what's called Azad Kashmir, so free Kashmir. Now, so they could have experimented, if they were genuine, to allow pro-Pakistan but also pro-independence people to have equal say in everything. The problem is that thing doesn't exist. So constitutionally, the interim constitution that binds Pakistan-controlled Kashmir Pakistan makes it very clear that the elected leaders have to work towards accession with Pakistan. Right? So only thing that makes Pakistan better than India, and it is better, is the horrible state and horrible conduct of India. And it is better because at least it's not killing the way India kills. Now one could argue that it doesn't kill the way India kills because people haven't fought or resisted the way they did against India. But that's an academic question. But overall, it is India that remains primarily cruel, has blood on its hand, and denies self-determination more crudely. Now, Kashmir inactive, as it's divided regionally, ethnically, politically, which is to be expected in any kind of conflict zone. Now, when we remind ourselves of uh, the division, one, now India is, see, India is a clever state, you have to admit it. I mean, it, they have learned a lot from the British. That's why they are very colonial also, right? In Kashmir and other places. Clever because at one level, oh, we are democracy. But, Everyone accepts that every government that's found in Jammu and Kashmir is dictated by Delhi. Then they say, we are democracy, we allow court systems. But courts are not allowed to, uh, in most cases, um, prosecute military men. It's an odd kind of democracy. It's like Assad kind of democracy in Syria, right? Or something along those lines where courts, civilian courts don't have jurisdiction over uh, military men. Or military, it's military men, not military women. So I could say military men. Or military persons. Now, the idea is that generally what's common across the people, the beat with pro-Pakistan, pro-independence, pro-Azadi, pro-human rights, even few, very few pro-India is that there's a right to self-determination. The idea is let people decide once and for all. Right? And therefore the demand for Azadi, which crudely or very not so crudely, very beautifully means freedom is at the heart of the struggle, is demand of freedom. Where there's freedom from India only to join Pakistan, freedom from both India and Pakistan, or freedom within India, within Pakistan, is comes later. But the idea, it is very much about freedom. And it is very much about human rights. That we have to keep in mind, right? Now, India, I said it's also clever because sometimes you speak to Indians about freedom and Azadi, they say, yes, it's Kashmiri Muslims. But what about? Now, they always have, what about Kashmiri Pandits? Kashmiri Hindu minority who were expelled there are a lot of it from the valley. So they were there. And this, the argument is that there was a genocide against them, though it's not killing. The 280 plus Kashmiri pandits were killed, but most of them were exiled. They said exodus. They said, what about pandits? What about Hindus? Now, it's a valid question. One cannot talk of a movement of self elimination by ignoring minorities. There's no doubt, right? The problem with this argument is if you bring in minorities to talk of human rights of all and self-determination of all is ethical. But if you bring in minorities only to justify the brutalization of majority, which is what Indians do, then I think it's highly unethical. And that's what Indians do. They have been, again, good followers of British, more clever than British, divided, at least British divided and ruled, and then quit. Indians are dividing and ruling. 
there's no idea of quitting at this stage. Now, why do India and Pakistan struggle over this? Very clearly, it's about geopolitics. Specific Pakistan is a large, significant size of territory. It's about territoriality. But to be honest, India doesn't really gain from territory of Kashmir. It has a lot already. It's a big state and it has difficulty managing this. But it's about nationalism. Remember, we are dealing with post-colonial states that are neurotic and paranoid about any change to the boundary. So that is why it's about nationalism. It's about religion to an extent. It's about resources, water resources. And that's why for Pakistan it becomes very important. The water resources in Pakistan come via Kashmir. So hypothetically, even if Kashmir was independent, let's say of both India and Pakistan, you could see that Kashmir is asserting that independence of the resources is going to harm Pakistan most. That's one of the reasons why they would not want an independent Jammu and Kashmir. Right? And this is what I talked in the morning, but I'll shorten it for you. The way I see it and I present it is that what we witness in Kashmir is full blown colonization by post colonial states. But it's colonization. Colonization because it involves asymmetric relations of power of one people over other, which is justified by talking of civilization, of democracy, of bringing progress, of providing the money. And the Indian. As you know, imperialists can be right-wing and left-wing both. Right? You see Putin or Mao or whatever, you know, right-wing, left-wing both. And imperialists can be liberal and illiberal both. So the liberal imperialists in India would argue that, look, Kashmiris, yes, something has gone wrong there. We have to help them out. But look, they're wearing jeans. Someone had written an article. A famous writer wrote an article saying that Kashmiris he met, young people, wanted to have go to KFC, where, wanted a pizza and they're wearing jeans. I don't know what's with jeans, I'm not wearing it, maybe others are, but something to do with jeans. So the idea was, they want modern life like us, which is fine, maybe they do. I'm sure they like KFC chicken, some of them. But the idea is, how does that justify brutalization? For them, liberal imperialists, it does. The idea is, we provide them progress. Now, there is no KFC in, in Kashmir. So let's, they have not even provided KFC. <laughs> Territorial control is there, very clear, that they are a part of colonization. You have got vocabulary of expression, how control is presented. Remember, colonialists never call themselves colonialists. Isn't it? So, fascists, well, fascists sometimes call themselves fascists, so let's not talk about them. Uh, <laughs> okay. But they will talk of all this progress, control, and all of this. Economic exploitation is there, you have got cultural subservience, racialization, seeing them as very different, militarization, social transform. All these factors are colonization. And when we look at Kashmir, it's very clear. You had Nehru promising in Kashmir, we will give self-determination, plebiscite. And you have a situation today when if there's an election, and this particular last election, 71% approximately voted, the vote, then Indians argue, Indian media also, that that's against militancy. That's against freedom. That's against everything. The point is, not a single Kashmiri party that's pro-India, you have to be pro-India too, right, to, to fight the election. Not a single Kashmiri party goes and says, we are pro-India and give us vote because we are pro-India. They always say it's about bread and butter issue, roads. Kashmir dispute is an international dispute that will be resolved later. But for so Kashmir party to get vote, always emphasize it's not about dispute, it's about uh, daily livelihood issues. But Indian media and Indian government always presents as end of the matter. You have had elections, so why is the need for plebiscite? You have got political territorial control very clearly. You have got economic dependence, image from floods last year. There were massive floods last year, and until today, if I'm not mistaken, the compensation that affected families are getting is two thousand five dollar, uh, maybe three thirty dollar or thirty five dollar per family, which is nothing. It's not a poor place. So all I'm saying, Indian government promised everything and delivered nothing. Sometimes, even if you were a good imperialist, you would actually do something for them. But it almost feels when you look at Indian government's policy that they want Kashmir dispute to be alive. They want violence there. You can see why they want violence alive. Violence is a good business. It's a good business that allows Indian military to remain a very important actor. It's a good business for right-wing Hindus in India to say, oh, these Kashmiri Muslims and other Muslims are all the problem. So it's a very good business. That's why they don't want the conflict to there. But there's an economic dependence. The so Kashmiris who were largely self-reliant in the past or dependent on what becomes part of Pakistan control are today completely dependent on India. So first you make them dependent, and then you blame them for being dependent. And then you blame them for being parasites. Now, ideas in India, a lot of electricity comes via hydropower of Jammu and Kashmir. 
but Kashmir don't get anything in return or much in return. And when Kashmir demand, the rhetoric is, oh, the, the thieves, they never pay for bills. Right? Now, of course, this dependence state, this image is from Kashmir's queuing and in crowd to get jobs with military and paramilitary. Now, most people hate military and paramilitary because they're science symbols of occupation. But the idea is there are no jobs. The only sector open to Kashmir that's flourishing like anything in Kashmir is the security industry. Now, security industry is not in the private one like G4 Security Corps and others. It is very much still the state one. So Indian state is making and involving more and more Kashmiris into the state through coercive branches because that what it would mean is if there is any resistance in the future, it becomes a civil war between Kashmiris. So you have one brother in army, one brother or sister or whatever in, in, in militancy and you fight to make them fight. And that's what's happening. So in bureaucracy now more Kashmiris are being involved. It's a racial and all production. I don't know how many of you watch Bollywood or have watched it, but Kashmir is always seen a beautiful, nice place or increasingly as hostile, bad, bad people, right? But it's always about that Indian act, female actors, so they can't find a Kashmiri actor, female actor, so they get an Indian family and she breaks the stereotype. Hmm. Now, all these, when you start reading and you realize how 1930s Hollywood it sounds. I can't explain, but that's what I'm working on, how 1930s Hollywood. The bad one, not the good to Hollywood, you know. But last year there were floods. Now, these are media reports, now Indian media, to see how the idea is, look, Kashmiris, they saved a decade and by military and then they say go back. Mm -hmm. So the idea is, Kashmir is thankless. Now you have this a supposed liberal new, uh, new woman, she's supposed liberal, right? Now, all this emphasizes how our boys are saving Kashmiris. I mean, they were, I mean, I, the first news that came out and first footage was of a woman being lifted after four days from water and mind being thrust into her mouth and saying, do you thank Indian government and Indian army for saving you? That was the crude level of propaganda that Indian army indulges in, right? And then, this means that from Jannat ke Fauji Farishti, it means from heaven. So these are angels. Oh, military angels. I don't know how military can be angels, but military angels from heaven. <laughs> Which is Kashmir in this context, right? All of them saving everything. Heroics and these are, see, defense forces, heroics expose separatist intellectuals. So critics like us cannot be intellectual, you have to be intellectual, always. <laughs> right? Now, you could say democracy, rule of law, India has rule of law generally, right? But there's AFSPA and other rules. So there's a particular law called Armed Forces Special Powers Act, which is an emergency law. Emergency law that was imposed in 1959, if I'm not mistaken, in Northeast India, another contest region. <laughs> where it allows military and anyone associated with military to arrest and kill person without threat of prosecution. Now in Kashmir they introduced in 1990. Now this is an emergency law when you're dealing with the immense uprising. But that law never disappears. So no, so it hasn't. We have been demands. So the idea is this law has been used by military to justify all kinds of killings. What it requires is, let's say, if you're the military person and you have been accused of killing someone. Right? So normally the family, let's say the family, he goes and says, no, I know these are the evidence. You go to the court, imagine, generally you'll be poor, you go to the court, somehow find the evidence, the court accepts, then say, okay, there's court, now you have to be allowed to come in, then your military, so your battalion or your regiment or your whatever, brigade, they have to give permission for you and they don't give permission. So therefore to prosecute, you need permission from Delhi. You need permission from Ministry of Home Affairs or Defense Ministry, right? Until today, from 1990 until today, zero permission has been granted. So you could struggle for 10, 15 years to reach up to a point where there's clear evidence against her, right? For killing, murdering, whatever. But until unless you get permission, she cannot be prosecuted. And not a single prosecution has taken place, right? So that's what the law, therefore, is not to protect the people from the state, but in this case, to protect the state from the people. And that's why I said colonial. Example, you could see similar image, terrorist attack, two soldiers killed, two injured, four civilians injured in army firing. And you wonder how come same newspaper, same image, same time actually gives the two. Because first, if there's a death, they assume it's terrorist being killed or terrorist, or terrorist attack and whatever, soldier killed. Within 10, 15 minutes, they realize that actually army had shot three, two to three men and killed them. Because the car had, first their version was the car refused to stop for check. So therefore, they felt that they are killers, or they are terrorists. 
with the idea of the car had skidded because the icy condition it had skidded and hit a tree so soldiers fired at the car now but i'm just giving example where even the indian military sometimes and indian military spokespersons sound more sane than indian media and which is rare feat by the way right any military spokesperson you know how awful they would be but indian media is much worse than them right there heavy militarization without going we can expand that in question answer but there heavy militarization everywhere these are helmets i found over somewhere and took picture and then it disappeared later right it's a police state very much every aspect of life is controlled aspect of life right violence is integral and it's violence at every day level of every kind <coughs> against is gendered based violence you have got <coughs> sexual violence you have got brutalization you have got bullying you have got murder you have got rape you have got every kind of violence you can think of it exists there at larger scale right see there some examples this is from pellet injury which is supposed to be non lethal right so you have got situation where okay there are 80000 and as okay as if it's easy but let's say up to 80000 people have been killed you have got disappeared people you got victims of torture that live then you have got those who get injured from time to time those who are blinded so indian state in kashmir is one that kills that brutalizes that tortures that blinds that controls over every aspect of body right they can't control the mind so they try to control the body at least right your situation of course this is from a particular village in 1991 where between 40 to 80 women and it could there's uh, no agreement over the number women were raped one night by an entire battalion now the indian government in had an investigation within few days without going there without going to the village without speaking to a single woman they came up with a report that is a conspiracy to malign the good image of indian army right that's democracy for you right so they have been struggling for justice not a single person has been prosecuted so far you got they were rape and sexual abuse and expand that in later you were enforced disappearance again their vigils and keep in mind people resist it's not that india is brutal and therefore everyone keeps quiet people keep resisting and part of it is that killing is a reflection of people resisting okay but something which i think is unique you know any occupation be it in balochistan kurdistan or tibet or in east turkestan in many other places has all kinds of brutalities right there's no doubt but something which is also here which i don't know how whether it exists elsewhere or not that control over the body so what indian rule in occupation in kashmir is not only about control over living bodies and the right to take away the life but it's also control over dead bodies so in this case maghul bhat the good example from 1984 indian government has not given the body back and it's not only because he's simple that is a factor avzal guru who was hanged in 2013 in on february 9 2013 he was not actual symbol of the nation even his body was not given back so the reason the main reason why bodies are not given back is because india believe it can do it why do believe it can do it goes back to international community because the image of democracy is so strong and the idea of rising india shining india and whatever india is so strong that no foreign power is going to question india right so the idea there was india can have a colonization over the living but also call an attempted colonization over the dead in this case also imagine in this particular case the person was hanged now even the supreme court said that there's no clear evidence but he should be hanged because collective conscience of the nation demands it collective conscience a very interesting thing with it's a collective conscience that justifies a killing right it happens and when they had to hang him what they did the wife was an in informed they sent a letter by speed post speed post is like dhl kind of thing except it takes 3 days not <laughs> and they didn't bother to call so you know this simple phone call someone going that didn't happen so she found out that her husband was hanged through media later rather than the government having curfew again why would any street do it they would do it because in the end they can get away with it because it reflects the nature of the state and the nature of the state is a cruel authoritarian colonial state while having the facade of democracy right now resistance of course we have all kinds of reason we can talk of that but people protest all the time there is demand for azadi you got to remember that again old image but people struggle this image i got it from internet so i don't know the some image i took it but 
This one, you have a heavy police presence and a man who's seen as a bad man dancing. So, and I, I you like this image because to an extent it reminds you that one has to be mad and insane to resist this level of militarization, which is heaviest in the world, by the way. Right? You know, have, have you been to Tel Aviv airport? Yes. If you go, you could see the kind of things scrutiny. It's as bad, if not worse here, because we experience both. Right? Now, in this case, you have to be insane enough. And yet, what you find are people insane enough to keep resisting the occupation, keep resisting the rule, and keep resisting the narrative about Kashmir that Indian media, Indian nationalists, Indian commentators, and Indian state promotes, which is everything is fine except what is Pakistan's fault. Finally, Pakistan and colonization, of course, we can expand that impression on said Talat and me. Let's leave it, but there's something somewhat similar, not completely. Police state. Now, last fantasy, a thought, I could end up with fantasy, right? Is that what's the option and everything? Keep in mind that this is a region that was a zone of contact. Now, whenever Kashmiri friends ask me, what's the hope, where do we get hope from? There is no hope from current state systems or current states. States have to collapse in order to either transform completely or collapse. Now, I always say to Indians that if you believe in Indian government or if you believe in state of India, then the onus is on you to prevent, so in order on you to be humane and not allow for brutalization in your name. But broadly speaking, demilitarization shouldn't be that difficult, it's crucial. This is where international community can play a role in pursuing genuine democratization. Both sides, both sides have problems. Respect for human rights, all these are nice, they should happen in any case. A right to self-determination. Now, for me, the argument is clear. Democracy essentially also involves right to self-determination for people. So it has to be part and parcel of genuine democratization. And the crucial factor is that the narrative around Kashmir has to shift from focus on India, Pakistan, India, Pakistan, whatever, right? Uh, to both cruel states similarly and majority in states. Shift from India, Pakistan to people, including those living the bottom, those living there. I think therefore we have to shift from obsessing about territorial conflict between two existing nation states to imagine that why do we think only in nation state terms. Why can't we think of third nation state or why can't we think beyond nation state? So in the end, the only ethical solution for the region can be Azadi. Thank you very much.